Democratic administration had restored peace and order to one of the worst divisions of the road. The Overland Stage Company transferred him to the Rocky Ridge Division in the Rocky Mountains to see if he could perform a like miracle there. It was the very paradise of outlaws and desperados. There was absolutely no semblance of law there. Violence was the rule. Force was the only recognized authority. The commonest misunderstandings were settled on the spot with the revolver or the knife. Murders were done in open day and with sparkling frequency, and nobody thought of inquiring into them. It was considered that the parties who did the killing had their private reasons for it. For other people to meddle would have been looked upon as indelicate. After a murder, all the Rocky Mountain etiquette required all that Rocky Mountain etiquette required of a spectator was that he should help the gentleman bury his game. Otherwise, his churlishness would surely, surely be remembered against him the first time he killed a man himself and needed a neighborly turn in interring him. Slade took up his residence sweetly and peacefully in the midst of this hive of horse thieves and assassins, and the very first time one of them aired his insolent swaggerings in his presence, he shot him dead. He began a raid on the outlaws, and in a singularly short space of time, he had completely stopped their depredations on the stage stock. Recovered a large number of stolen horses, killed several of the worst desperados of the district, and gained such a dread ascendancy over the rest that they respected him, admired him, feared him, obeyed him. He wrought the same marvelous change in the ways of the community that had marked his administration at Overland City. He captured two men who had stolen Overland stock, and with his own hands he hanged them. He was supreme judge in his district, and he was jury and executioner likewise. And not only in the case of offenses against his employers, but against passing immigrants as well. On one occasion, some immigrants had their stock lost or stolen and told Slade, who chanced to visit their camp. With a single, single companion, he rode to a ranch, the owners of which he suspected, and opening the door, commenced firing, killing three and wounding the fourth. From a bloodthirstily interesting little Montana book, The Vigilantes of Montana, by Professor Thomas J. Dimsdale, I take this paragraph. While on the road, Slade held absolute sway. He would ride down to a station, get into a quarrel, turn the house out of windows, and maltreat the occupants most cruelly. The unfortunates had no means of redress and were compelled to recuperate as best they could. On one of these occasions, it is said, he killed the father of the fine little half-breed boy, Jemmy, whom he adopted and who lived with his widow after his execution. Stories of Slade's hanging men and of innumerable assaults, shootings, stabbings, and beatings in which he was a principal actor form part of the legends of the stage line. As for minor quarrels and shootings, it is absolutely certain that a minute history of Slade's life would be one long record of such practices. <clears throat> Slade was a matchless marksman with a navy revolver. The legends say that one morning at Rocky Ridge, when he was feeling comfortable, he saw a man approaching who had offended him some days before. Observe the fine memory he had for matters like that. Said, gentlemen, and gentlemen, gentlemen, said Slade, drawing. It is a good 20-yard shot. I'll clip the third button on his coat, which he did. What, what the, uh, the bystanders all admired it, and they all attended the funeral, too. On one occasion, a man who kept a little whiskey shelf at the station did something which angered Slade and went and made his will. A day or two afterwards, Slade came in and called for some brandy. The man reached under the counter, ostensibly to get a bottle, possibly to get something else. But Slade smiled upon him that peculiarly bland and satisfied smile of his, which the neighbors had long ago learned to recognize as a death warrant in disguise, and told him to none of that pass out the high-priced article. So the poor barkeeper had to turn his back and get the high-priced brandy from the shelf, and when he faced around again, he was looking into the muzzle of Slade's pistol. And the next instant, added my informant impressively, he was one of the deadest men that ever lived. 
The stage drivers and conductors told us that sometimes Slade would leave a hated enemy wholly unmolested, unnoticed, and unmentioned for weeks together. Had done it once or twice at any rate. And some said they believed he did it in order to lull the victims into unwatchfulness so that he could get the advantage of them. And others said they believed he saved up an enemy that way, just as a schoolboy saves up a cake, and made the pleasure go as far as it would by gloating over the anticipation. One of these cases was that of a Frenchman who had offended Slade. To the surprise of everybody, Slade did not kill him on the spot, but let him alone for a considerable time. Finally, however, he went to the Frenchman's house very late one night, knocked, and when his enemy opened the door, shot him dead. Pushed the corpse inside the door with his foot, set the house on fire, and burned up the dead man, his widow, and three children. I heard this story from several different people, and they evidently believed what they were saying. It may be true, and it may not. Give a dog a bad name, etc. Slade was captured once by a party of men who intended to lynch him. They disarmed him and shut him up in a strong log house and placed a guard over him. He prevailed on his captors to send for his wife so that he might have a last interview with her. She was a brave, loving, spirited woman. She jumped on a horse and rode for life and death. When she arrived, they let her in without searching her, and before the door could be closed, she whipped out a couple of revolvers, and she and her lord marched forth defying the party. And then under a brisk fire, they mounted double and galloped away unharmed. In the fullness of time, Slade's Myrmidons captured his ancient enemy, Jules, whom they found in a well-chosen hiding place in the remote fastness of the mountains, gaining a precarious livelihood with his rifle. They brought him to Rocky Ridge, bound hand and foot, and deposited him in the middle of the cattle yard with his back against a post. It is said that the pleasure that lit Slade's face when he heard of it was something fearful to contemplate. He examined his enemy to see that he was securely tied and then went to bed, content to wait till morning before enjoying the luxury of killing.